Well, friends, welcome to another episode of On the Way Home. We have a very special guest from the other side of the country. Well, because I'm on the East Coast, we have someone from the West Coast. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for taking the time and your schedule to join us today. Pleased to be here. Great to talk to you, Michael. Now, we met back in Halifax, uh, back in the fall. We talked about this opening question. So you've had a little practice. Uh, no expectations, though, because, you know, things change. And, and this answer, actually, for a lot of our repeat guests, changes a little bit over time. And that is, what does home mean to you? Mm, yeah, well, I knew this question was coming as a longtime listener of the podcast. Um, and, you know, for me, home is about, it's about a feeling that you have, right? So it's a sense of feeling safe and feeling like you belong. Um, and for me, it's, that's the people that are around me. It's um, feeling safe and secure physically, but there's also something about a connection to the land that I'm on, um, and including the lands that have raised me um, here on the west coast of Canada, on the on the lands of Coast Salish peoples. Very, very cool. And I love that connection to the land. Uh, we always like to learn a little bit about our guests and their journey. Everyone's journey is a little different into this work. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yours? Mm. Um, yeah, so my my experience, I had an experience as, as a child of housing security, right? So I grew up in um, a middle-class uh, white family in a suburban mid-sized community. Um, and I really took that housing security for granted. And then um, as an adult, I started working with um, environmental and ecological justice. And I really started to um, learn more about different, different expectations and ways of supporting communities. And um, when I had the opportunity to join at the time, uh, Toronto Community Housing, it just was like everything came together. It was like, this is the way we can really advance change because um, housing is where we see the impacts of marginalization, of oppression, of broken social safety nets. And it's also where we can really make a difference on addressing, supporting people in the moment um, and also addressing system, the need for systemic change. So it was like it all came together. Yeah, you're right. And it all starts it all starts with housing and mm -hmm. hence the term that we hear a lot in this sector, housing first. Uh, mm -hmm. In broad strokes, tell me about BC Housing. I think it's widely known across the country for doing amazing and important and impactful work. Uh, but tell us a little bit about it. What's its mission? What's the scope of work? Yeah, well... Um, BC Housing is a fantastic organization. I think, as you mentioned, like for folks that that know housing, um, you know, when I had the opportunity to join BC Housing, I was like, yeah, sign me up, right? Because it's a really respected um, organization. And um, so our, our vision at BC Housing is that everyone has a place to call home. It, that's our North Star. It's um, something that we have really co-developed um, over the past year in particular, and now that's our, our refresh vision. And part of what makes BC Housing so unique is that we work right across the housing system. So we provide um, funding and uh, funding and support our partners with delivering homelessness services. We provide supportive housing. We provide affordable housing and seniors housing. We also um, partner to provide near to market um, housing through rental and through home ownership. So um, we work right across the housing system and we do that by working with more than 800 partners um, right, across, right across the province of BC. Um, and we also are one of the leading uh, residential developers, if not the top uh, residential developer, at least in the affordable housing space in Canada. Uh, and understanding that when you talk about being one of the largest, I think over the last six years, you've built more supportive, affordable housing uh, than any other uh, government agency in Canada. So lots uh, of housing across. We hear a lot about in BC in particular, I think a bit of it's weather related. There is a, a huge challenge around uh, homelessness, around housing affordability, uh, like and you hear usually the, the two big cities, Vancouver and Toronto, really, really struggling. Um, you've done a lot and you've had to pivot and BC chain uh, BC housing is has, has really been flexible creative and how they're attacking this this challenge can you talk to us a little bit about what's happened over uh, the past six years what have you uh, what have you learned what's gone well what uh, what hasn't 
for lack of a better term, what hasn't gone well? Yeah, um, it, you know, sometimes we we take it for granted in BC just the sheer volume <laughs> um, of what we're doing. Um, since since 2017, BC has added more than 78,000 homes, um, and of those. 39.5 thousand have been delivered or either delivered and open or they're underway through BC Housing. So that's nearly 40,000 homes through BC Housing since since uh, 2017. It's an absolutely shocking number. So most years we're popping out between 3,500 and 5,000 new homes a year. Um, it's, it's mind boggling when you think think about what that means, because that also means that every year, those are net new homes. So we're also growing the system by that number of new homes every year. So I would say that the, like the sheer volume is impressive, but it also leads to significant challenges. We're right, right across the entire development pipeline and across the housing sector. We're, we're running into challenges, of course, in terms of, um, you know, labor, labor challenges, um, supply chain challenges, particular, particularly during the pandemic. Um, and then we also are trying to scale the sector to be able to operate those, operate those homes. And, you know, and certainly, um, you know, you know, firsthand for your work with Blue Door, the challenges in particular with serving, serving folks with the complexity of needs that we see. We're seeing that in support of housing. But to be frank, we're seeing an independent housing too, right? With seniors aging in place, um, with families um, wanting to support support each other who might be facing complex needs. So we're seeing really that pressure in terms of the need to deliver the units, what that means for the delivery of the units, also what that means for communities as we're bringing in quite a significant number of new homes. And then also just you know what it means for the sector to be scaling, to be able to operate thousands of new homes every single year. Well, I, I mean, I think we, we talk a lot about the development of new housing, which, you know, you're doing a great job with, but you just mentioned some of the pressures that come along with that. Is, and we were told just recently uh, by some reps in the federal government, they said, if you're talking about funding, don't talk about operating or we're, you're going to see people run the other way, right? So people are pretty good at capital, but the, the reality is you got to operate those homes, right? And mm -hmm. that capital money. And, and, and I think the fear sometimes is, are we going to be on the hook for this kind of operating forever? Now, in fairness to the federal government, what they're saying is that we know that we know this, but we give a lot of money to the provincial uh, who then give it to municipal governments to do the operating piece. So operating is not on us. Now, they don't always say that well, as the prime minister found out a while ago, poor guy. He, this, he said, we're, we're not you know, primarily responsible. Uh, that's not, not what he meant. But, but I understand that the operating piece is very tough. Plus, it's not just the original building. It's, it's every year those buildings need to be taken care of. And as we mm -hmm. saw with Toronto Community Housing, you can't get a back, backlog, right, where you're actually losing more housing and you're creating uh, on the other end. How does uh, how does BC Housing work through some of those operating and capital cost challenges? Mm -hmm. I would say we have um, part of what's really what gives part of what gives me reason for optimism and hope is that um, you know I've spent much of my career clamoring and trying to raise awareness of the need to invest in operating and capital repairs as well as uh, you know capital development. Um, and we have a situation right now in BC where we actually have investment right, ac right across the life cycle of the building. So um, that's truly, truly exceptional. Um, and is something that we, we actually see support across the political spectrum for it, which I don't take for granted, having worked in this space for quite some time. Um, and so when we have a new building as part of the investment from the province of BC, they invest in the capital and they also invest in the operations of the building 100%. Um, it's, a, it's, it's really good to have that support from the province. Um, where we see really the need changing a lot is around the health needs of folks who are in those buildings. So that's actually funding that's coming from the health system, but it directly impacts our ability to operate the buildings and our partners' ability to operate the buildings, right? So we've got folks who are aging in place who perhaps need in-reach services. We've got folks who are living with mental illness, with addictions, with trauma, um, who need health services, mental health services. Um, and even if uh, the healthcare funding is there, they're 
the health system is also facing labor pressures um, to be able to make sure that they have folks available to support people with their needs. Uh, huge challenges. And I think that sometimes, even for people in the sector, it can get quite overwhelming. I mean, and when you would look at, I saw a post from uh, researcher Nick Falvo the other day that homelessness mm -hmm. is trending in the wrong direction. Uh, that we don't want it, in fact, is, is growing. Uh, what, you know, what do you say to the naysayers that say, it's not working? You know, uh, whatever you're doing is not working. We, we need to do better. You know, I think it's really hard for folks. Um, to see people in their communities living on the street. Um, we're all humans. And I think that, um, you know, there, there can sometimes be a villainizing and a bit of finger pointing at folks who raise concerns um, about delivery of homelessness shelters and supportive housing. But I think that ultimately no one wants to see their neighbors experiencing homelessness. Nobody wants to see people in their community in pain. And I think that it can be really hard to wrap your head around like, why are people still camp? Why do I see more people camping, sleeping in the park that I walk my kids through to school every day when you're all, we're also supposedly building thousands of new homes a year? I think that's a really hard thing for folks to wrap their heads around. Um, and so, you know, we have the numbers to show that most of the folks who are ending up in homelessness are new to homelessness. So it's not like when we move people indoors and we support them well, the vast, 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 vast majority of them remain housed, right? So I think some of it, some of our challenge ahead of us is recognizing that, yeah, you know, you're, you're right to be concerned. We want to reassure folks that what we're doing is working for people that are moved indoors and we just need to do more of it. Um, ultimately though, we need to pre prevent people falling into homelessness in the first place, right? Because that's, um, that's the most effective way to solve homelessness is to prevent people from ending up on the streets. Yeah, well said. I mean, so I do this activity uh, around prevention. I once had to uh, tell seven-year-olds, uh, I had to do a presentation to seven-year-olds on homelessness. I thought, what am I going to do? So I evolved water. And, and just what we did is we had this bowl of water and I said, this is homelessness in Canada. Here's your, your outreach workers. I got to give you tools. And I gave them spoons and they had to move homelessness. They had to get people to the services they needed, which were cups. But every mm -hmm. time they started making a dent in that, I poured new water in because something new was happening that was contributing to homelessness. Mm -hmm. A demonstration around it tell you stop new people from entering. To your point, you can't truly add homelessness. And for a long time, we were really focused on just reacting right so the prevention piece is is huge but let's talk a little bit about nimbyism as we speak uh it will be long after this this video comes out but we're going through a process in york region uh where a new men's emergency housing transitional housing uh in a a nice a nice uh, community is going in uh there is a pushback it's it's the usual uh bits around it's not the right site am i going to be safe our home value is going to come down um that that type of thing, and I'm sure with all the building that you're doing, you deal with this uh, at BC. Uh, how do you work through neighborhood opposition? It's it's so tough, right? Because um, I can almost I can get almost guarantee you for the that we can we can we can predict what a community what's going to come up through community up through a community opposition around almost any one of our services. Um, so it's very it's very predictable in some ways. Um, we consistently hear, yeah, we need more supportive housing. We need more shelters, but not here. And then there's a list of reasons. And so um, I think sometimes for some folks in the sector, that can be really, really frustrating. The flip side is that we know what misinformation exists. We know what people are going to be asking about, and we can get ahead of that. Right. So one of the approaches that that we take is that we create the space for people to have the conversation. Um, and because we usually know what people are going to say, we can make sure that we're bringing forward real, real information, um, fact based information, and also helping to bring that information alive with stories um, to help people really understand what it's going to mean. Um, one of the things that we do, for example, is we'll get questions around, a lot of questions around what is supportive housing? What does it look like? 
um, people who will be concerned that it's going to impact the safety of their neighborhood, for example. Um, and we can bring them uh, video tours of other supportive housing complexes so people understand what it looks like. It looks like most of the time a pretty standard apartment building um, with 24-7 24 /7 staffing, um, support services so that people can, can stabilize and have access to the services they need for a healthy life. So we, we try and get ahead of it by really listening to community and sharing with them the information that they need to understand what they're walking into. And um, does that mean that communities are all of a sudden, every single member of a neighborhood is like, yay, we support you? No, not necessarily. But there's a huge amount of trust to be built just by showing up and listening and listening to people and, and taking what they're saying seriously. Um, that often gives us enough space to be able to get to a place where we can open the building and then people can see for themselves what it means. Yeah, well said. I, I was once uh, taught in, in, say, public relations, you have people over here that will be opposed no matter what, right? You're not going to change my mind. This is the worst thing ever. And then you have people that I love all community housing. This is the most wonderful thing in the world. And then there's the in-between, right? Where mm -hmm. I have some concerns. I love, you know, if you can answer these, I'm open-minded in here. And this is where you're working. These are the people you're yeah. working with because those are the people that really want, you know, I have some, some questions. It's fair enough. I have some concerns or, or I'm a little scared. Help me understand when they're asking that. And I've, I've seen that. And it's been great. I've had some great conversations with people. Doesn't mean, like you said, they always say, okay, now I think it's wonderful, but at least they're open to it. And you work, you know, you work within that zone to do so. Well, BC Housing is always on the move, doing different and unique things. Uh, what's what's on the future horizon for, for you? Yeah, well, um, one thing that I can share, because it'll be public by the time this episode airs, is that um, we're launching a new program um, delivered. Uh, it's a program of the province of BC that's going to be administered by BC Housing. Um, really exciting uh, program to partner with the nonprofit sector, um, with the private sector to be able to un unlock uh, the value of public land, as well as the savings through government financing to be able to deliver more homes for a middle and moderate income folks. So that's our VC Builds program. I'm really, really excited to see that come um, because we know that from folks who work in housing, we know that, and to your point around that, the water analogy that you did with younger children, you can only get so far if you're trying to say, you know, to move that water into cups once the water's already poured into the bowl, right? Like ultimately we need more cups on the table. Um, and so that's part of what I'm excited about is for there to be um, more players in the game and that more really comprehensive approach to building housing for folks right across the system so that we can see fewer people pushed into homelessness. Amazing and, and well said. And, and I, listen, I, I live uh, in awe of your province. There's just so many good things. And I see the all levels of government are really understanding and putting resources and time into this. And I think there was uh, a big announcement last week just around uh, kind of rental acquisition and making sure mm -hmm. we're not losing. And and, and so I, I think, I mean, that's, that's huge. We talk about building new. We, we you know, whatever's out there already, we're losing a lot of that to criminal infrastructure, to the private sector. So to be able to acquire homes and keep them affordable in perpetuity, and whether it be a land trust or, or other methods, uh, it's huge. So, so I, yeah, things are going, I think, in the right direction. And BC Housing and building these thousands of units that, that they're doing uh, year after year is definitely part of the solution moving forward. Now, I know you do a bit of a, you do a podcast. Tell us a little bit about that. What's it all about? Yeah, so we have the Let's Talk Housing podcast, um, which is, uh, you know, just so much fun um, to be able to take part in that podcast. Um, and what we do is we try and create the space for people uh, who might not otherwise have their voices heard uh, to be able to talk about their housing journey. So in particular, residents, tenants, um, frontline workers, folks who work for nonprofits, um, and it's partly to my point earlier around our biggest challenge is lack of information or misinformation is where we're trying to create the space for people to talk about 
what exactly is it that we do every day in the housing sector? Um, and to be able to share their stories. So it's it's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, yeah, we're on all the major podcast platforms. So tell us the name of the podcast if people want to go find it. What's it called? Yeah, so it's called Let's Talk Housing. Let's a Talk podcast. Housing. A yeah, podcast. podcast by BC Housing. There's a few Let's Talk Housings out there. Um, and ours is the one that's by BC Housing. Very cool. Now, if people want to find out more information about BC Housing or find out what's going on at BC Housing, where can they go? Yeah, so you can find us on all of the major social platforms, and we're also at bchousing.org. Amazing. Thank you so much for all you do and for the team at BC Housing for all they're doing uh, to push us towards any homelessness uh, in Canada. It's so appreciated, uh, and we appreciate you taking time on your busy schedule to join us on the podcast today. Mm -hmm. It's been great to be here, Michael. Let's talk again soon. We'll see you next time. <laughs>